Today on the Andrew Cooper Writer Show, the year of 2020 was a year of political liability for both of our current governor candidates. We'll take a look at what occurred in 2020 and how their political opponents are responding. Then we'll go over how the state legislator has saw fit to waste our money over a hearing regarding just how racist hair care products are. Then finally, I'll go over what I did to upset the left this week. We'll have all that and more today on the Andrew Cooper Writer Show. But before we dig into it, first, let me encourage you to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Um, if you're listening to this on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, please feel free to go ahead and follow the podcast-only version on Spotify, Apple, Amazon, all other major podcasting platforms. Also want to deal with the fact that I know Monday and Tuesday we didn't have episodes. And that is because I had family come in from out of town. Uh, my sister-in-law got married. Uh, very busy with things like that going on. And I was unable to produce two episodes for Monday and Tuesday. But we should be back on track with our daily episodes coming out at 1 o'clock. Without further ado, let's dig into it. So in 2020, both Daniel Cameron and Andy Bashir had a year that the people on the other side of the political aisle uh, will point to as a number one reason not to vote for them, or at least fuel for the fire. You know, Bashir obviously had his handling of the COVID lockdowns being too long, overreaching, uh, being quite the issue. And then for Cameron, we had the uh, death of Breonna Taylor and his response to that. And and, and a lot of people, more specifically the BLM activists, uh, I took issue with the fact that Cameron uh, did not prosecute the officers involved. Uh, they say, you know, he, he lied to people during the um, grand jury hearing and and so on and so forth. And, and really, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you agree with with Bashir or not, it doesn't matter if you agree with what Cameron did or not, but what matters is how we're going to look at how the parties on the other sides are handling that and, and what in, in situation. And what we're going to clearly kind of look at here is that the liberal media and the Democrat activists have a much better relationship with the Democrat establishment than the Republican establishment. And, and it's just another point as to why the Republican Party, despite having the opportunity to win big in many areas, continues to be an absolute failure uh, constantly. I mean, this this shouldn't even be a close race, but obviously that's what we're seeing because Republicans suck at a lot of things. Republican establishment sucks at messaging. They suck at organizing. They suck at funding. They suck at uh, uh, not holding on to control when they need to, learning how to let other people control and, and, and so on and so forth. And you know, before we dig into the state level issues, we can look at a national level example of this, a, a perfect example, and that is Act Blue and Win Red. Act Blue and Win Red are respectively Act Blue for Democrats, Win Red for Republicans, are uh, donation platforms for candidates to use in order to bring in donations to their campaign. Incredibly important to have as many Republicans as possible using this for the parties. Why? Because what happens is, is they can centralize that donor data. Uh, centralizing that donor data causes better opportunities for, of course, the chosen candidates to have more accurate lists of grassroots donors and so on and so forth. So that way you have your text list and your email list and things like that, that you can hit up with for money. And the fact that ActBlue has been running since 2005 is when ActBlue was first brought into uh, existence there. And the fact that they've been harnessing and collecting up that donor data is a good chunk of the reason why that Democrats have a lot higher uh, small dollar donation amounts when compared to Republicans. It's not even close. As in, Democrat candidates will pull in four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times the amount in small dollar grassroots donations uh, when compared to Republican candidates. Democrats will out raise Republicans constantly. And yet for Republicans, that wasn't something they focused on. Republicans have always focused on the big dollar donations. Why? Because it's about control. You see, small dollar donors which is what Democrats uh, uh, have been harnessing. Small dollar donors means that, well, if they're donating to somebody like, I don't know, AOC, then you know a person that small dollar donor Democrats give a lot of money to or Bernie Sanders, well, that means they can't be controlled by your 
corporate interests by your sponsors. And so Democrats as a whole have done a better job of making sure to allow everybody to harness those small dollar donors. Uh, and that way they can still maintain control. But Republicans uh, as a whole, the Republican establishment, in order to maintain that control, they specifically have stayed away from small dollar donors. They don't care about them because that means that you wouldn't have as much control over your candidates. And it's because Republicans seek so much control that they miss out on an opportunity. But it's also why they're constant strangling a hold and wanting to hold on to the political establishment and, and that stranglehold there will be ultimately why they lose time and time again. And we see Democrats succeeding because Democrats know that one person, one groups, one establishment can't do everything the right way. And they do a very good job. You don't have to agree with their ideologies to recognize they do a much better job of allowing their activists to work. So going back to my example, Act Blue and Win Red, Act Blue came into existence in 2005. Win Red didn't even come out until 2019, long after other online donor tools had already existed and been created that Republican candidates as a common used. On top of that, because we know that the Republican establishment seeks to control a lot of things, a lot of candidates actively choose not to use Win Red because they don't trust the establishment because they don't believe we're all pulling in the same direction. And a big part of the reason why they believe that is because, quite frankly, Republicans refuse to allow, the Republican establishment refuses to allow the types of people, the grassroots activists, the small dollar donors, a seat at the table. And this is why we are seeing that a, an incident that you have less people galvanized around, the Breonna Taylor death, there are less people that, that quote unquote, care about that than care about COVID. It's just facts that matter because COVID affected your everyday life. You had mass mandates, you had your businesses shut down, you had your uh, econ economies were stopped, uh, people lost jobs, overdose deaths, so on and so forth. The ramifications for COVID were far reaching. The COVID shutdowns far reaching and far greater than anything that the Breonna Taylor incident could show. But yet, <clears throat> what do we see? We see the Courier Journal three and a half years later still has amongst their home screens, or if you go under news, they have an entire tab labeled Brianna Taylor. It's like their second tab under news labeled Brianna Taylor. <clears throat> when we looked at activism, what do we see? We see Brianna Taylor's mother and active and other activist groups like until freedom. They're spinning up activism here in Kentucky and to push forward for the Democrats. They're trying to turn out the vote, register voters and push people out there. And more importantly than that, and you could say, well, you know, there's some Republican grassroots groups that try to organize and push. North Kentucky Tea Party does a good job. Um, Warren County Republicans, uh, or, or is it Warren County Conservatives, I believe is what that group's called down there in Bowling Green. They do a pretty good job. There's some loose groups here or there throughout. Uh, there's a few county parties that do a good job. But this is something that the Democrat establishment does that the Republican establishment doesn't. They, the, the Democrat establishment will turn around and help fund and help push these activist grassroots groups that are accomplishing a goal they need. See, the Democrats recognize they need somebody to go message on the things they cannot. They need somebody because take Breonna Taylor incident. That is a, maybe it's a incident that people want to stay away from because you don't know how middle of the road voters feel about it. And for Cameron, maybe he wants to stay away from hitting too heavy on certain issues like abortion, for an example, uh, because he's worried about how middle of the road voters will feel about it. Well, that's where you have these lefty groups or righty groups, and we should have righty groups, but this is why Bashir and the Democrats have these lefty activist groups that they pump money into to go out and do the things that the campaigns can't. They go out and do the ballot collecting and ballot harvesting. They go out and do the, the registration drives. They go out and do the communication on topics so the Democrat candidates don't have to, or when they say something, they don't appear crazy in it. You see, the problem is Democrats don't stop. They are always pushing their message and they are always constantly pushing forward ideas into the culture. For Republicans, it seems like the only time they talk about ideas around an election. Take, for an example, the abortion. We've I, I did an episode where I talked about how Cameron flip-flopped on this and how there's better messaging lines. But the problem is, is we are about a month and, and, and a week or two out from an election. 
And he doesn't have time to adjust and change how an entire culture feels about abortion. He doesn't have time to message the way he needs to to fully flesh out an idea. The, those messages, those ideas should be coming from conservative activist groups and right to life groups in the off seasons where they're pushing that out there and they're pushing out not just uh, occasional whatever, but they're pushing out ad campaigns and everything else. I mean, look at uh, uh, Bashir. We have Planned Parenthood getting involved. We have all these issue groups getting involved. And the closest we have to an issue group getting involved in the camera campaign is a school choice group. That's it. We don't have a big push from COVID people. And the reason why we don't see a good push from COVID people, look, in 2020, you had a lot of Republicans wake up, want to get involved and be activists. You had some of the largest Republican uh, gatherings ever. Look at, look at the Democrats. Uh, they had that teacher, that massive 120 teachers protest where hundreds of people showed up and they turned that into a victory for Bashir in 2019. Now it's 2023. You had an opportunity to take what happened in 2020. All these conservatives and Republicans woke up and activated and the Republican establishment, they had an opportunity to grab a hold of them and turn that into a, a easy victory for Cameron this year. And I, we don't know if he's going to win or lose, but it doesn't look good, right? We've talked about that. They had an opportunity to really harness that in a Republican conservative state. This is a state that went, what, plus 60, plus 65 or something, or, or, or 60, 65% for Trump. And we have, we're questioning whether or not a Democrat candidate will win. And they want to sit there and say, well, we got to be moderate to not scare away people. Is Trump moderate? I'm sorry when I missed that memo. Anyways, point is, is that they took that occurrence and they used it to win elections. But that's something Republicans can't do because they can't give up that power. They can't enlist a group because what if they bring out a grassroots group? What if they fund them? What if they bring out something that's organized and they put together something? Well, they may not be in control of every single piece of item and messaging they have to say out. And that's just something they can't handle. Instead, when the Republican establishment has activist groups or activists or opportunities before them to really push forward and help and get people together to do the messaging they can't, what do they do? They don't train them and offer them. They shun them immediately. Shun them before I ever, ever ran for the state senate. Uh, you know, before I ever ran for office, a person who was hired on at RPK told me this, that one of their questionnaires where they ask how you feel about people, they were asking how people felt about me. Before I ever ran for office, they're saying, do you like him or hate him? Because if you like him, we don't want to hire you. I didn't even done anything to them. The only thing I've done is voiced down and said, hey, we need to get this done. Push forward the same thing. You hear Democrats and, and Democrat and Democrat grassroots people all the time saying, we need to get this done. Calling out people saying, why can't we get health care for all? You need to be pushing for health care for all. And blah, 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 blah. And instead of putting them on a list of asking people how they feel about them so you make sure you don't hire people who are too sympathetic to my messaging... Instead of doing that, what do they do? They sit down with those activists, they talk to them, and they create a game plan for how to get done what they do. But instead, what the Republican establishment does is they want to put everybody in a corner. And they only want you to come out when they want you to come out now. They need you to go knock doors for Cameron now. And they need you now to be a team player but then they're shocked that they don't have the organization in place. You have people running door knocking campaigns for RPK that have never even done it before. This is their first time. Why? Because the infrastructure doesn't stay in place and they don't keep groups together to organize and train them. And so my point is this, we can look at the Cameron and we can look at the, the governor's race there, we can look at Andy Bashir and we can see where the Democrats have their activist groups. They're funded. They're allowed to operate how they need to. 
They can message in a way that campaigns can't. And they can organize outside of the campaigns in order to help get people elected. When you look at the Republican side of things, you don't see any activist groups that are well-funded. There are none. Absolutely zero activist groups that are well-funded. Why? Because they don't want to fund them. They don't want to put money into them. And they don't want to tell some billionaire, millionaire, whatever, hey, go put uh, uh, half a million dollars into this. It's tax write-off, whatever. It's a 501c3, but it's going to help us win. They don't want to tell anybody to do that. They don't want to tell them to do that because they're concerned that, well, but then we may not have control. Well, you know when you'll also not have control? When you're not in power. You, when you're not in power, you can't do anything. So yeah, you may not have control over this little messaging base over here as much as you'd like. And so you're worried about funding them, but at least you can win elections. What do you see the Democrats doing? Winning elections, not worrying about these groups of powers over there. Just, oh, that's it. Maybe sometimes they eat one of our own or what have you, but at least we're winning elections. I mean, how is it possible? You have horrible economies. You have horrible results. I'm talking at the national level. Nobody can afford anything. The average cost of living is higher than the average income. You have food insecurity, turmoil everywhere, and yet Democrats continue to win because Republicans don't have an ability to message on it, don't have an ability to organize on it, and they keep losing and they can't look at themselves in the mirror. They say more cowbell. Say, well, we just need to be even more moderate. We just need to even be more Democrat light. And if we have these activists in here, well, they might push us farther right. And if we can't be farther right. Then we'll lose elections. Well, these crazy left, far left people are winning elections now on the far left side. You need to fight fire with fire. Well, y'all, coming up after this, we'll talk about how our state legislators fell free to uh, waste our tax dollars and time hearing about how racist hair care products are. We'll have more right after this short break. 859 Print has local service and low prices. I personally have done tons of business with them. And I can tell you whether it is getting things printed off, sending direct mail, making business cards, buying TV ad time, digital marketing, they can do it all. And as a special for listeners of this show, they're offering 10% off any and all print services using code RIDER2024. That is code R-I-D-E-R-2024 for 10% off. Check out 859 Print. You'll be glad you did. Now, our legislature does <clears throat> a lot of things to waste our time, to waste our money, and to do things that don't make a whole lot of sense. And longtime listeners of this show know that one of those groups that at its best wastes our time and money and at our worst pushes forward just awful policies is the statutory committee that is called the Commission on Race and Access to Equal Opportunity. And apparently it would appear that this commission is ready to be broken down. It's ready to be removed um, because quite clearly every issue that is of at all any importance to them has been apparently directly dealt with. And I say that apparently and directly dealt with because uh, yesterday they had a hearing that covered um, hair care products for black people, minorities, I guess. Um, and, and they talked about hair care products and it talked about, uh, uh, things that the, the, the chemicals and things in hair care products, yada, 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 yada. But the important thing, look, look when a legislature talks about something and has a hearing on something, it should be centered around, generally speaking around law proposals. Not generally, that's all it is. If the legislature is hearing a hearing on something, it should be because they're requesting a law of some sort. And I'm not saying that knowing information about having chemical-free products and finding them and blah, all that stuff. I'm not saying that's not important. It's not important to me. I use got to be hair gel and that's about it. Um, but anyways, but that could be important to you to put good and healthy products in your hair. That's great. But why does that involve our legislature? Unless you think that I'm making up 
that this was a useless, complete waste of taxpayer time and dollars. Let me play for you uh, the woman who presented on this on 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 hair care products who interestingly uh she actually doesn't have a whole lot of hair which is kind of ironic but anyways who presented on this i'm going to play for you where she outlines what her talk is going to be about listen so let me give you a brief outline of my talk so i'm going to give a little background on on uh, hair its structure its formations some terminology the reasons why African-American women straighten or relax their hair, and I may say, Afri say African-American and black interchangeably. Uh, I'll talk some about hair relaxers, the harmful chemicals, and some other products, hair products, and the harmful chemicals in those. I'll lastly talk about the desires of black women versus the reality, especially in terms of their hair care, their hair care journeys. Their hair care journeys. I'm so glad that our tax dollars are funding hearings on hair care journeys. But one thing you heard in what she outlined and talked about, you never heard her say that she would be requesting some type of legislation, laws, policy proposals or changes from the legislature. She didn't do it. She outlined uh, hair care journeys and, and, and what people are looking for in hair and the chemicals that are out there, but she, she never really talked about what she wants the legislature to do. And that's why this is a complete and utter waste of our tax dollars. If you want to advocate for better chemicals in your hair, well, then you go out there and you ask for uh, opportunities and platforms to talk about that that aren't taxpayer funded. You don't do it on taxpayer funded because here's the other thing too. You had legislators sitting there listening to this, right? One of the legislators on this commission is Whitney Westerfield, somebody we talked about when we talked about the car uh, uh, act or whatever it's called, the car uh, push that he's making on red flag gun laws. We talked about that last week. So we had somebody that we know is already a crazy person. We have a legislator on here that already likes to make unconstitutional overreaching laws because he himself doesn't actually like the constitution. We already know that we already know he's more than willing to use government to overreach. No questions. And in fact, what's funny is when she did ask her questions at the end of this, the first person asked him questions, Senator Whitney Westerfield. Not a shock he cares a whole lot about hair care products. After all, as anybody who paid attention during the 1AG's race knows, he, um, he one time got admonished for being late to court because he was getting a uh, manicure done. <laughs> because he was late to court because he was getting manicure. So not shocked that he himself... Uh, uh, cares so much about beauty care and hair care, but more importantly, are, are you asking them to pass a law? Are you asking for the state of Kentucky and their commission on race and access to equal opportunity to put forward laws to dictate how companies can market and what they sell specifically to minorities? Because what the claim is, okay, the claim of the entire presentation, right? And this is so stupid. We even have talked about this. The claim of the entire presentation is that companies, there are more dangerous hair care products in products used by hair care chemicals, sorry, in products used by minority women, specifically black women. And it is because, it's not because companies are targeting black women with it, but it is because that, Black women typically have curly hair. And what they want, according to her presentation, is straight hair. And in order to straighten a curly hair out to long, it takes some more chemicals. And they're taking that to be, and I mean, remember, she's giving this presentation to a committee called the Access to Race or, or uh, um, Race and Access to Equal Opportunity. So I guess she's claiming that 
black women don't have the same equal opportunity to uh, less chemical full hair care products because of marketing and, and there's not enough companies offering it, I guess. But it's got nothing to do with black women. It's got to do with curly hair. In fact, Whitney Westfield, when he asked that question, mentions the fact that he's got kids, some of which have, I guess, curly hair or something. He's talking about hair types. I don't know. It's weird that he knew it. But anyways, hair types and how they can't find any products to straighten out their hair that are uh, uh, doesn't full of harmful chemicals. His wife has trouble finding it. So it's not just black women. It's everybody with curly hair that wants to see it straight. Anybody who has very curly hair that wants to see it straight has to use products that have very dangerous chemicals in it. That's just everything. And like I said, it's stupid that this, a political commentary show has to take time to talk about this, talk about hair care products and the chemicals in them because we have a legislative committee that saw fit to waste our tax dollars on something like this. It is absolutely ridiculous. Well, coming up after this, we're going to go over what I did to upset the left after this short break. Lexington Overstock Warehouse is Central Kentucky's best source for stylish new home furnishings. Don't pay retail. With our low overhead operating structure and big name brands, we offer the absolute best values on new furniture for every room. Shop online anytime at LexingtonOverstockWarehouse.com or visit our weekends only showroom located at 156 West Tiverton Way. Right now, for listeners of this show, we're offering a special discount for our online customers. Use coupon code FREEDOM for an additional 10% off your online order today. Lexington Overstock Warehouse, low overhead equals really low prices. Listen up, my fellow business owners. You need to get your cybersecurity and IT support under control. Reach out to the folks at Amston today. Call 859-300-0087 or visit Amston.com. It is no secret that cyber attacks have become a constant threat, and you need to make sure that your organization is protected. Amston has over 30 years of experience working with businesses and governments alike. Call 859-300-0087 or visit at Amston, A-M-P-S-T-U-N dot com today. Now, last week, I talked about uh, Daniel Grossberg. It was at the end of one of my shows, and I was talking about how he, um, at one point, decided to be transgender, I guess, then grew out of it, and he posted some confusing things. You can go back to the episode. But two things happened. One is I posted um, this uh, uh, post here. It just simply outlined that Daniel Grossberg is a Democrat, Kentucky State House rep. Daniel Grossberg went to college in Grinnell, Iowa. Grossberg would have been 25 at the time of this being published in The Advocate on October 13th, 20, uh, 2003. And then, of course, I posted the excerpt uh, going over Grossberg from Out Magazine decided he would go ahead and um, go through and uh, say how transgender he was. And I posted this on both... Facebook and Twitter. And, um, you know, the, the general response is, of course, from lefties and, and even some people on the right was, well, why do you care? Why is this any business of yours? It's not business of mine. Um, you know, why does this matter? You know, people respond. And uh, G. Perry Edelman said, so what if he is? How is that any of your business? It's none of mine. And yada, 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 right? And, you know, it's always funny to hear people make this claim of why would I care? First off, Daniel Grossberg cared enough about this to make an actual article in a magazine called The Advocate. So clearly he wanted people to care. So to, to get mad at people for caring about something that people wanted you to care about in the first place is just silly and ridiculous. And I wish it could be a part of culture. We just stop. Why are you noticing? Why are you noticing? On top of that, in this case, it's incredibly stupid and dumb to say, why does it matter? Why does this matter when you're talking about a sitting legislator who is making policy on this issue? This specific legislator, as I covered, defended chopping the genitalia off minors and giving them uh, uh, lifelong um, medications that have lifelong side effects like uh, sterilization because they identify as a different gender. That's what he supported. That's what he pushed forward. 
And showing that he himself was transgender and grew out of it means that he knew that they could grow out of it, but yet he pushed that forward. Anyways, that's why it, it all matters. It matters because he himself has proven his logic wrong. And this is what I went over. And there's a lot of people, left and right, actually, saying, oh, he shouldn't care about this. Or why are we talking about this? We should, this is a hit job. You know, some people saying, well, why don't you have time on your hands to do this? Well, look, I've got a lot of time on my hands often when it comes to politics. I have time to post about things and talk about things. Don't worry about it. As I said before, I, I do uh, normally a, a daily, of course, the last, last two days, but I do a 30, 40 minute show daily, Monday through Friday. I have time. But also, it matters. Because he's a legislator. It matters because it's a part of our culture. It matters that somebody who wants to stand here and victimize children, he himself knows that they can grow out of it. So that was one way I upset the left last week. But here, in a more ridiculous way, let me show you this one. So this is a photo, obviously, from 11.06.2020 um, that shows gas, uh, the lower gas at $1.82 premium at $2 and 32 cents says 11 06 2020. And I said, just putting this here. I just posted it. That's all I did. I just posted it said, just putting this here. And Oh boy, you would think that I stomped on their puppies, man. The left came out of the woodworks to explain just how dumb I must be. They go on to claim and And, and I think this really shows kind of the breakdown of our society. And I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But most of the comments that were negative, a lot of positives, obviously, but most of the comments that were negative was about how I don't understand how oil pricing works and it's a global market and so on and so forth. But here is what I know. What I know is, is that America under Trump was a net oil exporter, not an importer. And what I know under Biden is that he's making it harder and harder for gas companies to drill on federal lands. Additionally, as well, the policies he's pushing forward is chilling investment into the fossil fuel industry, funding a fossil fuel industry, and creating new wells and pumps and so on and so forth. What I also know <clears throat> is that the longest stretch of four years straight, we had four years straight of the, the longest stretch we've had of low gas prices. Gas prices that never topped three bucks a gallon was under Trump, the four years under Trump. If we go all the way back almost to 2003 or four, we don't see four years consecutive of those kinds of low gas prices under any president during any of their four years ever. It was only under Trump. And this is what goes into the breakdown, I think, of our society, of our culture, of everything else. I would post up, I, I would I would quote what the prices were. So a lot of people claimed, oh, it was only this low because of it was a global pandemic. That's why it was so low. What do you know? And I go, okay, um, well, um, in 2019, so in 2020, November 2020, average gas price was 220. In 2019, it was 269. 2018, it was 273. So you want to claim like, oh, this is all just because of a pandemic. But when you look at the prior years, Non-pandemic years, you see gas significantly lower than it is now, a dollar or two lower than it is now. And because they can't handle that fact, well, then they claim. So first they claim that, oh, it's just because of a pandemic. And then you show them that gas prices were lower prior to pandemic years. And then it's, you're too stupid. You don't understand gas is on a global commodity. Oh, I understand gas is a global commodity. I also understand that if we're making it, we can set our price. See, that's the thing. If we don't have to import your gas, we're a net oil exporter. Guess what? We get to set our prices. And the rest of the economy can shape around it. And also, fuel may be a global economy, but the petrol dollar is a U.S. dollar. It's ran on U.S. dollar. So U.S. currency policy affects gasoline prices around the world. So because the U.S. dollar is the expected currency for oil around the world, our financial policies matter to it. But they want to claim it's a global market. I get it. It is a global market that trades on our money that we dictate the financial policy on, that we're one of the biggest players on the stage of, 
that we could produce more oil than many of these people can. We can be a net oil exporter. But instead, that is something that the Biden administration has fumbled on. But what's odd is, is you can look at data and show Trump had the lowest four years of gas prices in 20 years. And people will still sit there and argue with you that, oh, it's not about Trump. And, and, and that's the breakdown of society. When we can look at the same data, the same graphs, I literally, I was in a comment back and forth, like two or three comments. I really don't comment back and forth a lot on Facebook or Twitter with a person. And I'm like, they're like, oh, this is because of pandemic. I show the prices. Well, this is because, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, it's a global market. You don't know what you're talking about. Well, I don't know. I post a graph showing the four years of lower prices under Trump. They said, oh, prices were lower under Obama. Obama was handling it. Show them the graph again. Looks pretty good to me. Trump's four years look great to me. Everything below three bucks a gallon. When we can't even agree on the data, we can't objectively look and say, yep, the lowest four years were during Trump. And that's what the data says. But instead, you look at that same data to come up with a different viewpoint, a viewpoint to reinforce your already stated belief. That's what's going to cause a breakdown. And that's what means we're not communicating anymore. And I don't know how we see a way forward. Well, y'all, that's what we have time for today on the Andrew Kubrider Show. Please be sure to like, comment, share, and uh, let me know how you feel. Send me an email, too, if you don't want to say it publicly. You can email me at info at theandrewshow.com. Thank you all so, so much for listening, and have a great rest of your day.